There is a place up north, far north, a place called Wolf Country. When I heard that wolves had been removed from the endangered species list after 40 years of protection, I was surprised, as I knew we only had a few thousand wolves left in the country. And it troubled me that we were still so divided in our thinking about this highly intelligent species. So I decided to travel to places where they still could be found and talk to people who knew and studied them. And somehow, try to understand why there were those who still feared and misunderstood them. Wow, it's a beautiful day. And we're headed up to northern Minnesota to go see Jim Brandenburg. Jim Brandenburg has been photographing and writing about wolves for over 45 years. He's known all over the world for his study of wolves. This is a really unique area that we're going to. It's, it's actually called wolf country. And where Jim lives, it borders on the Boundary Waters canoe area, which is a million acres of pure wilderness. Being out here, it's very different from where I grew up. You can see all kinds of wildlife. You can see eagles, and if you're lucky, you might even see a wolf. This is northern Minnesota. It definitely takes a unique and hardy person to live out here. Everybody's up here for a different reason. My reason was to be close to the wilderness and to photograph wolves. Or to see wolves, I didn't have to photograph them, I just wanted to be around them. And it evolved, uh, it took me years, many, many years to get some decent photographs. So it wasn't a practical consideration, it wasn't a, a job or a career move to come up here and photograph wolves and do posters and do books and do movies. It was just an intuitive, fire inside of me. I got into photographing wolves and telling their story because I thought they were the most persecuted animal in the world more than lions, more than tigers. I really believe the, wolf, the wolf's reputation was the worst misplaced reputation of any animal in the world. And I thought, there's a story. Nineteen sixty-eight. About a mile from here, I was walking with my camera, Nikon F, Manual exposure with a 300 millimeter lens, snowshoes on Lake One, on the end of the Fernberg Trail, which is right here. I saw a wolf before it saw me. I fell down on the ice and the snow. 
crouching, thinking maybe, maybe I can sneak up in this wolf. Maybe the wolf won't see me. The wolf kept coming. The wolf saw me and it said, ah, is that food? Is that a beaver? Is that a dead moose? Is that a dead deer? Is it, what is that thing? The wolf started stalking me. You think I was excited? That's one of my first encounters with a wolf. And I was stalked by a wolf. I have photographs to prove it, not just a story. I cherish those photographs. But you should see the look in that wolf's face when it finally decided that I was a human. That's when I knew that wolves were slightly different than what I thought they were. I could see all the embarrassment condensed in one expression and walking away like, well, you fooled me for a second, but don't tell anybody. That whole this series of photographs is precious. They've never been published. Steve Paragus and his wife have lived up on the edge of the Boundary Waters canoe area for over 35 years, outside of a town called Ely, Minnesota, which is the closest town to wolf country with a population of 3,500 people. They came and fell in love with the wilderness and decided to make it their permanent home. Now it's their backyard. They have an outfitting company, Paragus Northwoods Company, where they lead canoe excursions, including a Howling for Wolves canoe trip. You know, I mean, we enjoy, we live in a place that's wild enough that we have wild wolves in our neighborhood and we hear them howling. And I mean, I had a great experience with wolves myself, uh, just a half, oh, about a mile actually from here when I was out on a run. A very unusual opportunity to see wolves close up. There was uh, two adults and two, two very young pups. Uh, it was in May, so it was probably, they were probably six or eight weeks old. And they were down in kind of a hollow in a clear cut. So I could, as I ran along the road, I could see these four wolves, two adults, two pups. And uh, they saw me and the, the mom, I assume the mom, kind of a large gray wolf. And the other one was a very dark wolf, much smaller. Um, the mom kind of scurried up into the woods and made a high-pitched call, really high-pitched screaming kind of call. And, the, and everybody followed up into the woods. The babies stopped. They were just rolling over each other like two little pups having fun. And the mom started, you know, alerting them, and they walked up into the woods together. So I got around the back side of the hill, and I imitated this little sound, this, this high-pitched call that the mom was doing. And lo and behold, out of the woods come the two pups like right to me, right within four feet of me. And they, you know, they thought I was the mom calling to them. So uh, I said, wow, this is, this is pretty neat. And uh, with seconds later, uh, the trees kind of start shaking down the hill. Down the hill comes the mom the tr making a, a show of it by shaking the trees, shows up right in front of, the, in front of me with the two pups, looks at me and runs away. I thought, that's fairly unusual for the mom to run away. And uh, a couple of seconds later, back she comes, same thing, trees shaking, you know. And this time she stands over the pups. I'm probably 12 feet away at the most. Stands over the pups, all of the hackles on the back of her neck come up, her head lo lowers down. She's looking straight at me and goes, Whoa. <laughs> I said, you know, intellectually, that was the one time I was a little afraid <laughs> of wolves. The place we meet wolves for the first time is in that fantastic story, Little Red Riding Hood. And it's not a very complimentary story to wolves. It, in fact, is one of the first fear characters that we as children engage with. These all relate to some of the myths around wolves, and, and they're dangerous because they're not accounts of actual wolves, they're not accounts of real live wolves and the behaviors that wolves engage in. Werewolf, the loup garou, was uh, was uh, this little mischievous creature that would come at night and steal your shoes. Right, misplaced. So you wake up in the morning. What are my shoes? Oh, they took it. Right. And so you go into the forest looking for this creature that is hiding behind a tree with your shoes. 
and all of a sudden it became this, you know, bloodthirsty animal that would steal your kid. No, you have shoes. The risk of being injured or killed by a wolf is, is, is minuscule. If you were afraid of a wolf, your car keys should be taken away from you because you're far more likely to get in a car wreck. You shouldn't step in an airplane. You shouldn't go outside if there's a lightning anywhere nearby. These are all far, far more common causes of injury and death. And so wolves simply uh, are, are not a, th a threat to human beings. It's just a, it's a silly thing to think so. The wolf made a decision to join the human family. Somehow, some way, because they fit in. Why did the wolf come into the human family 40, 50, 60,000 years ago when the cat didn't or the horse didn't? Because it seemed to be a little more of an easy partnership. They blended in a little bit better. That was a decision that the wolf made for sustainability and survivability. You think there are more dogs in the world than wolves right now? How many millions and millions of dogs are there in the world? That's, that's the wolf. The wolf decided that somehow. It's clear that the evolution of the wolf to the dog has had a huge impact on man. Think of the many gifts from the wolf. Seeing eye dogs, service animals, even companionship. Scientific studies have even proven that people live longer that have dogs. And the wolf is more intelligent, has advanced senses, and a bigger brain. We are similar to them. They're not similar to us. It's very interesting because, I mean, we learn in our initial programming, a lot of it we learn from them. On average, a wolf walks for about eight hours of every day, and they can walk at quite a clip. They can walk at four to six miles an hour. And so if you want to know what it's like to be a wolf, walk, and just keep walking, and walk, and walk, and walk. Walk day after day. This is a big, big part of what the life of a wolf is all about, is walking. It's the simplest thing. The next most important thing is, is also something that's very, very uh, closely related to humans, is, is that wolves live in families. They live in packs, and a pack is basically a family unit. And while wolves spend about eight hours of every day walking, they spend about eight hours of every day socializing uh, with their pack mates. And so if you like living in your family and if you like walking, you have a great deal in common with wolves. And the next most important thing to know about wolves is how it is that they get their food. They eat things that are generally bigger than them, sometimes up to 10 times their size. And so wolves capture their food, whether it's a moose or a deer or an elk, they do it by killing it with their teeth. Imagine killing something that's 10 times your size with your teeth, and that's the only way you're gonna get to eat. And so it's incredibly heroic, it's incredibly dangerous uh, to be able to get food in this way. Um, the, you know, a wolf is capable of living to about 12 years of age, but their life expectancy is about four years of age, and one of the most common causes of death is starvation, the inability to get enough food, and it's just because it's really hard to kill something that's 10 times your size with your teeth. I grew up in this hunting culture where you defined your worth in some ways by how many pheasants you could shoot, how many ducks you could get, and what kind of a trophy you could get. The biggest buck with the biggest antlers. And if you could go shoot a wolf, oh, you're a real man. One day I found myself heading north with some friends from Hardwick, Minnesota. They're probably 10 years older than me. They're going to go wolf hunting. Okay, is that the ultimate animal? Maybe it is back then. There was a bounty on wolves, $50 bounty. What does that mean? It means that Culturally, it was a value to kill them, right? So us naive prairie kids, they imagine they were in their 20s, I was 15. Let's go up north, go look for wolves and go hunt them. So I had a M1 carbine, World War II vintage that I got from NRA. I was a young boy expressing my cultural norm. And if I could go up and kill a wolf, I would be the hero of my town. It'd be in the newspaper, there'd be pictures, so I went up north with my friends and looked and walked through the woods and scared. Scared that I'd see a wolf, scared that I wouldn't. I was a good shot and if I saw one I might have killed him and didn't see one, didn't see any tracks. To me the ultimate question is why do you kill the things you love? 
I think it's a primal thing. It's a male thing. Uh, we go back 30,000 years to the cave paintings in Lascaux in southern France. Picasso said that it's the most beautiful art man's ever created. We can't even equal that. They loved them, but they killed as many as they could to eat them. So it's in our genes. I mean, for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years, we hunted. We forget that sometimes, I think, in this century. It wasn't that long ago we depended upon the weapon, bow and arrow, battle atl, spear, gun, to go out and keep our, our families alive and keep ourselves fed. Well, we haven't evolved past that. We still have that strange kind of an instinct. We want to quest, we want to hunt. It's very powerful. Most of the stuff of what we do in life is a gradual slide into a consciousness or a point of view. Some of us reach those points where something happens one day and it changes it. You meet someone, you read a book, you watch a movie. This particular day I was 14 years old, up at a state park near Laverne, Minnesota, where I grew up. And I was a fox hunter at this point. I killed fox for a living, and I liked it. Most, one of the most exciting times of my life. Yet I loved fox. Outwit them. Not easy to kill a fox, they're very smart. You have to be pretty good at tracking and watching. And you have to be a good shot. But there's a certain point you evolve somehow, you change. The camera just happened to come into my life somehow as the artist. I was up in the Blue Mountains with my camera instead of my gun, and I saw a fox off in the distance. Well, I learned from an old friend of mine, Judd Cooney, 10 years older than me, that did the same thing, how to squeak like a mouse to make the fox think there's free meal. So I hid behind a rock and went, Fox came running, I peeked up, just as the fox came within maybe 10 feet, made a click with my $3 plastic Argus camera, and I thought, wow, that's amazing. And then I got the picture back. A week later, whenever you take it to the drugstore, and black and white film, and it's processed, they come back with a little print, and magic. I shot the fox. I captured, there's my trophy. There's my bragging point. I don't have a fox skin, I have a photograph. But this is even better. I can put it in the wall, and the fox is still alive. It didn't take long. But from that moment on, it was a different story. And uh, I'm still doing the same thing. I'm still a hunter. St I'm still tricking animals, sneaking up on them. Jim had met Will Steger in the 80s, and the two embarked on a well-known expedition to the North Pole. Jim had heard about the white wolf not being afraid of man, and became fascinated with the idea of a similar mission to the Arctic, and the unique opportunity to document and live with wolves in the wild. Less than 500 miles from the North Pole lies Canada's most distant frontier, Ellesmere Island. Only someone with a passion for wolves would dream of tracking them into this desolate land. One such person is photographer Jim Brandenburg. Wolves have always been a favorite animal of mine, and I suppose one of the reasons they're my favorite animal is because they're so intelligent. That intelligence makes it uh, nearly impossible to film them in a more conventional place, say, in the forested areas. And for some reason, these Arctic wolves have, have got a quality about them where they tolerated us very well, and it became clear that it would make a wonderful story. In 1986, Jim's White Wolf premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and won numerous prestigious awards. White Wolf also became a best-selling book and was the cover story for the National Geographic magazine. When I was involved in that, I felt this is the highlight of my career. I will never equal it, except one thing, maybe. If a bunch of aliens popped down on my property and said, Jim, come with us, 
on our spaceship. We're going to go off to another planet. I'm not kidding. It sounds funny. This is my. This is a true conception of. I thought when I was in the middle of the White Wolf experience, I thought I will never equal this, and I was right. I've never equaled it since. Our tent, me and the researcher, was within a five-minute walk of the den. Lived right with them as a family. We had problems with the white wolves coming and stealing our stuff out of the tent. So it's very different than here. The wolves up there had were kind of blasé about humans. To see a wolf here, back in those days, was rare. I know people in Ely that spent a lifetime here never saw a wild wolf. At times, it pays to speak wolf. The alpha male, the leader of the pack, the father of the pups, the boss, injured his paw for about three weeks. He was injured and couldn't really hunt. The rest of the pack took care of him. Saw it, I mean, it was clear. They had babysitters, Scruffy we called. The pack would go off hunting. Scruffy around the pack would be very submissive and, and wolves are like humans. They beat up on each other. You see a weak one that's uh, the, the, in every class, 30 kids, there's always one kid that everybody picks on. Not everybody, but they get picked on. Wolf packs the same way. This Scruffy animal, we called Scruffy, the rest of the wolves beat him up all the time. Constantly were picking on him and chewing on him. Well, when the rest of the pack went off hunting, Scruffy was a designated babysitter. Scruffy did that to the pups. Scruffy was the, the big boss. And that was a very subtle, complex behavior with wolves. I saw stuff that mimicked a lot of human behavior. Aunts and uncles and children and brothers and sisters taking care of the pack. Not just casually, but very tight family unit. The very last day, as we packed up, the den was about seven miles away from the landing strip, a little, very small, remote landing strip. And got in the airplane, packed the stuff up. My lump in my throat was as big as the airplane itself. Looked out the window, and there was the family of wolves sitting there, like they were saying goodbye. Next to the landing strip, as we taxied off and took off. And I think of that as a story that someone would make up. But I, my mother's grave, it's a true story. I haven't been back since. In the words of author Barry Lopez, and to approach them solely in terms of the Western imagination is really to deny the animal it behooves us to visit with a people whom we share a planet and interest in wolves, but who themselves come from a different time space and who, so far as we know, are very much closer to the wolf than we will ever be. James Taylor called one day, the singer, wanted me to help him with an album cover. He wanted a wolf on the album cover, and that surprised me. His album, Never Die Young. I didn't think he knew much about wolves, but he knew a lot about wolves. Came up here and saw wolves. I asked him if he'd do a benefit concert. The wolves. He said yes, we did two of them, one in Minneapolis, one in Madison, Wisconsin. Raised some nice money. Some of that money went to the Defenders of Wildlife. The Defenders of Wildlife leveraged that up into a, a program to give the ranchers around Yellowstone an excuse to allow the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone by paying for the cows that the wolves killed off the park boundaries. So in a tiny, small way, James Taylor and I had a fairly significant role in opening up that dam 
to let the wolf be reintroduced into Yellowstone. We didn't know if the wolf would survive in Yellowstone, particularly. They thrived. When the wolf returned to Yellowstone after an absence of over 65 years, scientists discovered an ecological phenomena called the trophic cascade. Trophic refers to the different levels of the food chain, plant being one, insects the next, all the way up the ladder. And the wolf had a cascading effect. The elk and deer grew stronger, the aspens and willows flourished, even the grass grew taller. And the most fascinating was that the rivers recovered, along with its many inhabitants. Despite being small in numbers, this top predator would not only transform the ecosystem, but also its physical geography. Magical story of ecology and a missing piece being put back in. Sometimes they say, once you break something in the environment, you can't fix it. That's magical. I'm very proud of that. And every time you listen to a James Taylor song, think of that and thank him. They will rise from along the like a big balloon. Take the sky sick of Good shot. The end of her. Then, in 2011, something shifted. Despite a sea change of attitude about this iconic species, President Obama signed off on delisting the wolf. The same year, state legislatures in the West pushed through a wolf hunting and trapping bill that would put the collared wolves in Yellowstone in jeopardy. Soon, gunshots were reported around the globe and millions mourn the death of the most famous wolf in the world. Researchers knew her as the alpha female, 832F, but to many, she was known as 06. And this is where wolves are revealing in, our, in humans what might be a, a great failing. And, and the concern is this, basically, is, is that as a country, we don't know how to answer this very simple question, which is, what is an endangered species? And there's definitely controversy about how to interpret that phrase and what it means, but whatever it means, occupying 15% of your historic range could not possibly count as recovery. And snaring, I wasn't even aware of snaring. I mean, I had heard of, I learned about that during this time and now I'm just, so appalled that 75% of the wolves that were killed during the trapping season were killed by snaring. The trap itself is created in such a way that it will catch any animal that steps into it. And that may, would mean not only the target animal, which in this instance would be the wolf, but would be any other animal that steps into that trap. A beautiful male coyote, three to four year old male coyote was caught in a wildlife services trap. And it appeared to us that this animal had been in its trap from the extent of its injuries and the tissue for anywhere a week minimum, but possibly two weeks. As we investigated this situation and looked around, we found other coyote tracks within his area, right around him and in the snow around him. And what was interesting is it appeared to us that possibly his mate or another coyote was actually helping him survive, was actually protecting him against other predators and probably bringing him food too. If the American public saw this and understood the brutality and the cruelty of this, that this program would be ended very quickly. 
I often ask people who abuse animals and do nasty things to animals, would you do it to your dog? And some people don't like to hear that because it puts them in a very uneasy space. And, you know, thank goodness if I've talked to somebody who's, you know, trapped a wolf, shot a wolf, done something harm, poisoned prairie dogs, um, harmed coyotes, and I'll say, well, would you do it to your dog? They go, well, no, of course I wouldn't. And then I'll say, well, how come you can do it to another animal who is also sentient and conscious and feels pain? And oftentimes, with a lot of people, there's a pause. And it's an important pause, I think, because they haven't ever put their dog in the place of those animals. Following the delisting in the Yellowstone area, the wolf was about to face a new threat in the Great Lakes region. Senators Al Franken and Amy Klobuchar petitioned the Interior Secretary for the delisting of the wolf in Minnesota and were calling for a state-regulated wolf hunt. Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. President. We're not quite done with wolves. Sorry. Um, I have the A18 amendment. Senator Dibble offers the A18 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dibble moves to amend House File 2171 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 adopted by the Senate April 17, 2012. As follows, page 22, delete section 50. This is the A18 amendment. And it was very clear what the intent of that committee hearing was. It was to roll out a, a plan to hunt wolves in the state of Minnesota. This is even before the official delisting occurred. The first hearing at the legislature was January, was a day before the delisting, it was January 26th, in the House and in the Senate. The, the rush was on, the pressure was on, there was going to be a wolf hunt. The big agricultural groups, the big hunting groups had done their homework, had effectively lobbied all the chairs of the committees, already had a plan in place through the DNR to begin this hunt in 2012. The bill was rushed through. It eventually was incorporated in the Game and Fish Bill, where there was some debate on the floor, but it was just too late in the process for us to stop it. The authority that has been working on, on wolves for many, many years, no, uh, no question about it. There was no hesitation on that particular call. He was asked directly on that particular conference call if it is time to manage wolves in Minnesota, and this man said, absolutely. And he said, because of the numbers, number one, and because the numbers, if they continue to grow at the rate they are growing, they're going to be causing problems amongst themselves. Yes, so recently the federal government proposed to delist wolves throughout the lower 48, excepting for uh, Mexican wolves. And whenever the federal government makes a proposal like that, it has to go through a scientific peer review. And so I was selected to be a peer reviewer along with a couple of others. And we were selected on the basis of our uh, credentials, on the basis of what we knew about wolves. It was later discovered uh, that myself and, a, and these two colleagues of mine were not favorably disposed to this particular proposal to delist wolves across the country. And when that was found out, uh, we were uninvited to be panelists to review this document. And that created some controversy for folks because, of course, that's not a, a very sensible way to go about a peer review to just take people off because you might not like the opinion that they would come to. And, uh, and this really is just a symptom of a much bigger trouble uh, that we have in the planet. We think that, uh, uh, that life is just full of a bunch of opinions and one opinion is the same as another. And that's not the case. Uh, it, the thing that makes a scientific opinion different from any other kind of opinion is just how well it's defended. And so it, it doesn't matter what my opinion is. What matters is how well reasoned it is and how well defended it is. Members, it's, it's very easy for those of you who live around here and you can watch wolves on television and, and uh, but it's a lot different for people that actually live in wolf country where wolves live, where parents are afraid to leave their kids alone to wait for the school bus. I know one of the editors of one of my newspapers, and when she takes a walk at night, she carries a handgun with her. 
because of wolves. The decision was made, and now to take it away from these people that are so impassioned about the wolf, to kill the wolf. There's deep, as much passion as you see to protect the wolf, there may be more passion, maybe more, to kill the wolf. There may be, and it's, it's a laser-seeking hot point on a politician's skin, and they are just, I mean, it's, it's pathetic. Members, if you'd really like to see what the wolves do in greater Minnesota, take a look online of the picture of the young man that was taken out of his sleeping bag while he was camping in northern Minnesota. And take a look at his skull, where there are staples, where the wolf took a big chunk out of his head. A wolf attack is incredibly rare. Matter of fact, there's only two recorded attacks in the entire United States in over 100 years. Now, the last one just happened in Minnesota recently, and they, they shot and killed the wolf, and then they, they tested him for rabies. He did not have rabies, but what he had was he had an incredibly deformed jaw, which prevented him from hunting. He had been kicked out of his pack, and he was doing things that are not normal wolf behavior for survival purposes. Management is very much needed. I suggest that we let the DNR do their job. And for those that live of us that live in greater Minnesota, where we have wolves, where we see wolves, they're not just little German shepherds that live in your backyard. They're big wolves, and they're a problem. And I truly believe that the problem comes from too many wolves. I'm not against the wolf. The wolf is a beautiful animal when he's where he belongs. Um, but he's not that beautiful when he's in my cow yard. We, um, you know, I see a lot of t-shirts around here today that says howling wolves on it. Um, you know, if I'm laying in my bed in a motel down here in the cities and hear a wolf howl, that's a beautiful sound. But when I'm laying in my bed at home and my wife and I hear a wolf howl, it means we better hit the floor running because he's probably after one of our livestock in the yard. The concern that the farmers have expressed is that their cattle or livestock will be taken by wolves. And as a result of that, they've supported wolf hunts in this state for many, many years in Minnesota. We've gone back and we've reviewed some of the data on this. There are 165,000 cows and cattle in wolf territory in the state of Minnesota. And that's the principal farming group that's concerned about depredation or the taking of livestock by wolves. What we learned last year, and this is very typical, in 2012, there were only 81 verified cases of livestock losses in the state of Minnesota. That's 81 out of 165,000. Now, in our judgment, that doesn't constitute the basis for a hunt. We understand farmers are making a living. We understand many of these farmers are using non-lethal techniques, not all. We strongly urge the USDA to work more closely with these farmers and the DNR to ensure that they're taking all non-lethal actions possible. And that could mean different lighting techniques, flattery, which is simply small flags that seem to discourage wolves, llamas, guard dogs, burrows. We know they work. A lot of research has been done both in Minnesota and Wisconsin and out west. Non-lethal methods are effective, but when they don't work, we understand the need at times to take offending wolves, but that doesn't constitute the basis for a hunt. If you've got a wolf, you know, moving around your farmland, you need to do something to strengthen your boundaries and reinforce your territory so that that wolf knows when he's transgressing out of his range. There's the emotional level, where when our livestock get predated on, that we don't overly react emotionally out of old stories. So it's negotiating that space too. We get lots of folk who are sort of crazy wolf lovers and don't necessarily always want to appreciate the reality of what wolves mean in the world. Yes, they predate. They are hunters. They're carnivores. I handed out for you a story from the April 7th, 2012 edition. And so you don't have to read it. I'll just kind of read you a few quotes out of it. I had this constituent, and this is what it says. She was pruning some bushes near her deck, stood up and turned around, and quote, and there was a big black wolf baring his teeth 
very close, just a few feet away. She took a few steps towards the house, but to her dismay, she saw another wolf, smaller, gray, and mangy looking, about eight feet away between her and the house. She slowly backed away from both animals to her truck. As she unlocked her truck, she said, the wolves hunched down and growled at me. That's a quote. When she got into her truck, she honked the horn, but the wolves stayed put and barked at her. Remember, that's a real experience that are happening, maybe not every day, but every week, where wolves really live because they're overpopulated. The secretary will take the roll. That was it. So they were done. It was a done deal. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I left there and I thought, oh my goodness, what is going on? And I approached the legislature. His name is Representative David Dill. He is a Democrat out of Crane Lake. And I approached him in the hall near the elevators and I said, have you considered the ecological benefits of the wolf? You know, even if you're a hunter, even if you're an angler, no matter who you are, whether you're a wildlife you or a hunter, angler, somebody who believes in, in keeping ecology intact, you have to believe that the wolf is a necessary part of that. And he basically said to me, oh, nobody's talked about that. And then he kind of caught himself because he realized, well, that's a reason to have somebody testify. And he started panicking, seriously. He was running from the elevator button when it didn't come right away to another elevator button saying, there will be a wolf hunt this year. And I looked at him because he was like running away from me and I was the only one in the hall and I'm a short statured small statured woman, he was much taller, and I said, I'm not chasing you. You don't have to run. But I think he knew that he was basically facing what, what he was going to face soon. This year, wolves lost their endangered species protection. Wolves keep forests and streams healthy. They're wilderness allies. 50% of wolf pups die of starvation, and many wolves are poached. While Minnesota's original plan had a five-year waiting period, a new wolf hunting and trapping bill is now being passed by the legislature with no regard to its impact. We are recklessly endangering our wolves. Tell Governor Dayton to stop the wolf hunt. We are about to lose all that we worked so hard to save. Don't silence our wilderness. Studies suggest that the wolf became the dog when wolves began to follow hunters to scavenge on the kills that they had left behind. And in the process, some became isolated from other wolves and migrated along with people. And over time, the human family became their pack. Girl, say goodbye to mama, come up. I'm gonna miss you. Be good, be good girl. I think it's safe to say 700 at least wolves were killed this season. So if you look at the rough numbers, it's about a fourth of the wolves, right? Is that fair? Yeah. A quarter of the wolves. Yeah. So, you know, I guess the argument that a lot of people have who are concerned about this is that that's a lot of wolves. And what? even if it's a thousand, which would be a third of the population, which it still, could be, which that's is. still within the range of of what's been identified as um, a number that that may be sustainable. Has anybody ever st studied long-term effects on wolves and wolf packs when you go in and you start taking out pack members? There's been studies looking at at wolf pack dynamics, not specifically, not necessarily, you know, measuring this influence of hunting or trapping, but, you know, through radio collared studies of wolves, there's been um, documented high turnover rates in wolf packs. So there is a high mortality level. They're, they're already without hunting and trapping. Wolves can get hit by cars. They can get trapped for depredation control. They, they get killed by other wolves. And there is this, you know, pretty steady changeover in wolf pack structure. 
But I've never, I've never seen, and you may have something, but I've never seen, you know, long-term research done because we're talking statistics, we're talking right. numbers. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I, and I, I'm, yeah, there, that has not, I, like I said, has not been studied specifically. Whether or not hunting and trapping has an influence on the stability of wolf packs population-wide, I mean, it, certainly at an individual level, you're going to kill a, a breeding animal. But there's other animals in the population that come in and replace those animals. The DNR never um, brings any attention to the fact that, you know, it's not just blatantly killing animals. It's, it's actually wiping out this very cohesive system that packs have. We've lost sight of that a bit in our thinking about management of wildlife and management of wolves today, clearly with the wolf hunt mentality. And talking to Dan Stark at the DNR, you know, they think about, they think about the wolves as, you know, just numbers. They don't think about them as being feeling, sentient beings who, if you take out, certainly if you take out the top member, the breeding pair, it's, it's devastating to the pack. But even if you take out other members of the pack, it's, it's not like you come in and replace these. You can't replace a relationship. You can't, you can't replace the value that, that one wolf has in the pack. Well, here is an array of portraits, wolves from the past in the neighborhood. It was a core pack of eight or so with 19 wolves that we counted over the years so that this was done. These are, I think, around 15, with just personal names for me to remember. Broken foot, crooked ear, blind one eye, beautiful one. But this one was the papa. This is the alpha male oh, that was shot before the hunting started, illegal hunting. It was shot illegally not far from here. I was very familiar with 19 wolves here around Ravenwood one year, when they were really doing well, lots of deer around. I photographed each one, gave each one a name, had a little portrait of each one with a name underneath. The alpha male was killed by a hunter less than a mile from here. I know who did it. I asked them to be careful. I talked to them before the hunt. They were setting up their hunting camp. I said, please be careful. There are a lot of wolves here. I know it's tempting. This is long before the wolf hunt. It's hard to talk about this. This is about three years ago. And uh, we found that uh, the alpha male, Blackie, was killed of this pack. The wolf I've been photographing and watching for three, four years. Biggest footprint I've ever seen of a wolf. Interesting looking wolf. He was pure black and I watched him turn gray. But he'd been radio collared. The hunter didn't want to, anyone to find out where he killed the wolf. So he snipped off the radio collar and dropped it off near Ely to throw off the signal. Well, I know basically who did it. Uh, changed my life, changed the wolf. The wolf pack was totally different after that. Totally, they seemed to disperse. Everything was different. I couldn't make hide nor hair of it. They, they disappeared. Uh, everything changed. I changed. since then. It broke my heart. It really destroyed me in some sense. I have not been the same. It, it, broke, it drove me to tears. Whoa. 
We know in Minnesota, the one survey that was conducted by the Department of Natural Resources before the hunt began, in that single survey, 79% of the respondents opposed the season, yet they went ahead with it. we had wild lands where they could find refuge. And you know why I feel like I'm fighting to protect the environment from? The yeah. DNR! Yeah. Hello, this is Jane Goodall. I really wish I could be in Minnesota to greet you in person, but I am thinking of you. There you are, gathered to make your views known to those who have the power of making decisions. They're absolutely unique, your wolves the only population in the lower 48 states that wasn't exterminated. I personally have a real love for wolves. They show all the characteristics of loyalty and courage that we admire in our own domestic dogs. They have similar emotions such as contentment and fear. They know suffering and pain. It's time that recreational hunting of wolves and other forms of persecution came to an end. And you in Minnesota, by insisting on a just wolf management plan can lead the way. I would not kill a wolf. I know that because he's here for a reason, and just like I am. We all are here for a reason, but we need to acknowledge that. And then we went to the Fond du Lac Reservation and we had a ceremony honor honoring the wolf. Um, it, actually, that was extremely moving. Um, it was sad to me because the, the Ojibwe culture really values the wolf and the people there, um, they were talking about how the wolf would hide in caves, the wolf would escape. They were, they were trying to think of any way that they could cope with the fact that these wolves were gonna be killed. By the time we drove back to the Twin Cities that day, November 3rd, 2012, we'd already had seven wolves killed. Yeah, I think it was wilderness, uh, Edward Abbey said something about if we destroy the last of the wilderness, I mean, we destroy the very, we're, we're threatening the very idea of freedom itself. It's what makes us a people. It's not just some abstract thing out there for recreation to go visit in a canoe or a backpacking or something. It's what we are as a people and we need to hang on to it. We got to fight corporations. We got to fight this recreation industrial complex that is threatening these precious wild lands that are so diverse, the foundation that, that supports our being here today. 
is all the microorganisms in the soil and the plants and the animals that walk on it, the animals that swim and animals that fly. We're all intertwined, it's that great web of life. And my Ingen, the wolf, he's our brother. He's right there with us. We walked the earth with him. I found that there are many indigenous cultures in the world that have always revered the wolf. I interviewed Chi Mayingen, which means big wolf, from the Red Lake Nation. For the Ojibwe people, there's no separation between the wolf and them. The wolf holds the medicine and teaches humility. You know, one of the first designs I've created was a circle. And everything after that was placed inside the circle. And therefore, everything moves in the circle. Even the human, from childhood to childhood, the seasons go in a circle. All the stars, the sun, the moon, the earth, it always moves in a circle. And what that creates is what they call a rhythm. There's a universal rhythm. And I, I kind of joke about that too, you know. <clears throat> See, everything tries to be round. They say, everything an Indian does try to be round, you know, so I'm trying to be round too. Because <laughs> <laughs> the all traditional Indians are round. Uh, you have continuity. <laughs> <laughs> the creator told the animals, you know, to take care of their brother, the human being. Otherwise, the human being would not have survived. The animal people, yes, we will watch our brother. We will give him our hide. We'll give him our flesh. We'll give him our bones so that he can live. So we owe that to the animal people. And today, we're going to pay the animal people, and especially the wolf. We're going to pay him back by killing him. Medicine, when I think of the role it has in bringing us back to our own center of integrity, which means wholeness, basically, where our own regenerative health powers can find their balance again. In that sense, medicine is a catalyst. And I see the wolf. In a sense, one can say the wolf is medicine. But then that raises for me another question, which is, well, what are we ailing from? What is the ailment? And I think when one looks around the lands across the world, there is one in this time we live in. The ailment that we, we struggle with is fear. It is fear of the enemy, it is fear of the neighbor, it is fear of the self, it is fear of power, it is fear of love, it is fear of so many things. Fear of the loss of livelihood, in the case of those living directly with wolves. And all these fear elements for me are directly embodied by the wolf. The wolf is a great mirror towards us. We have so many similarities, and as you talk about in that Ojibwe myth, the wolf is in a sense our partner and our brother, and was in the past. And I think going forward, there is, if one looks at the wolf from a, as a medicine in that sense, there's really much that we can learn in our current society from the wolf. Inspired by the idea of the wolf as a symbol of medicine, I decided to go to California and spend time with a group that is doing something very unique with wolves, wolf dogs, and people. <laughs> that was nice. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, I feel special. A wolf rehabilitation center in Acton, California, that believes strongly that the wolf has great value and is a teacher that we can learn from. And we're at a wolf hike they do. Each month they'll take people to see their wolves and wolf dogs and teach them about wolves. They rehabilitate these animals. And then they work with people and inner city youths and people with PTSD. It's quite extraordinary what they do. We have the kids come in. They're coming from all different backgrounds. Most of them are at-risk youth. 
coming from inner city situations, they've come from gang violence and, you know, that kind of a thing. And they come in with their walls up, always needing to protect themselves, make sure they're safe, they come in, they've got their attitude, they've got their swagger going on, you know, they're like coming in, they're like, whatever, what do you got to teach me? And they come in, oh, they got their, you know, earphones in and stuff, we go, take your earphones out you know, hand them over. <laughs> you're gonna stand here, you're gonna sit here, and we're gonna make a circle. And we're just gonna get really present. And the minute that they all truly drop in and let go of that stuff and center themselves, the pack will actually begin to howl. And this has happened numerous times. And every single time, the kids go, oh my god. And for the rest of the program, they're putty in our hands. It's incredible. Ah. <laughs> oh. oh, what a vicious wolf. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> and inevitably, they'll pick one or two particular wolves that they really feel a connection with because of the story. Then when they finally get to meet that wolf and they get to sit with that wolf and they get to look into the eyes of that wolf, looking into the eyes of a wolf, it's like you're really seeing your own soul and that is incredibly healing. You take a look at this, it's posture and, and how big it is and you would automatically be scared of it. But in reality, it's just, just a loving creature. It just, it just wants to be loved like anybody, anybody and anything else, it just wants to be loved. It wants to be <laughs> the delisting of wolves. You just have to, you just have to really just, You just really just have to really, if you really want to help. I've, that's love right there. Get my psychiatrist. This is where I come specifically besides the walk-in is quite nice. Where things do feel better. When I think about crises in the world, crises happening around me, especially with the wolves. I feel better here and it helps me. It's a time of reevaluation. That's what the wolf has taught me, in an odd way, right? In a very odd way, this whole wolf hunt has made me confront things that I don't have answers for. My investment in telling the story and seeing it was maybe wasted. There's a lesson there, I have to get beyond that. I have to think about that a little bit. I'm pretty angry. Anger is not a solution and something you shouldn't carry around with you. I've been gone a lot because of that. Choose to certainly during hunting season. The pups are born, there was a den nearby. There were pups born, they're out there. Uh, I'll think, well, they'll like the first hunt. The last wolf I photographed was Blondie. And that was the wolf that was shot, and she was a pup. She was nine months old. I'm afraid to bond to these animals. I bonded to every, I knew, I've probably known 30 or 40 wolves, like friends over the years. And I'm afraid to do that now. It's been a couple of years now and it's not getting any better. Mm -mm.
I came back to Minnesota for one last interview with Jim before I was to wrap up the film. But with another wolf hunt on the horizon, it was a bit of a somber reunion. But just as we were about to pack up, Jim, with his unique ability for resilience, said he had something he wanted to show us, something he had just found, but he hadn't shared with anyone before. And I wondered in that moment if Jim, too, was looking for some hope. I can't explain it. It happens to me a lot. I don't know what it is. It, it isn't psychic. It's something else. It's just curiosity. Because I'm so curious, I eventually ran into something interesting. I don't think this den necessarily pulled me psychically in the wolves saying, come see us, Jim. But it almost feels like that, because it, it's happened to me enough times, and especially here. So just up around the corner, I looked down and I saw the grass was all matted down. I thought someone came here for a picnic, except nobody comes here. It was very unnatural looking. So I just couldn't follow the trail up and looked a little bit further and saw chewings on the tree. I thought beaver, no, den. Wolf den, too fantastic. Maybe fox or coyote came up saw this. Virtually the minute I saw this den, within the minute, almost the 15 seconds, I was standing on a very supple twig branch. It let loose as I started walking towards the entrance, just to look, I mean, I was 30, 40 feet. It snapped me in the eye and it felt like a hammer hit me on the head. So you've got the mixture of exultation of seeing a wolf den at the same time, getting spanked in the eye, just about knocked me out. I knew I had pretty serious eye injury. And I, it just came to me, you're not supposed to be here. I wouldn't have stayed here anyway. You can't be around wolf dens without them possibly moving. I wanted to get out of here quick. But the eye being injured by this twig was too much to comprehend. And I didn't know what to think, except is this another message? Is this come look at? Come, here's the den, but don't come in. As an investigative reporter, as I am, you want to get the story. You want to tell every bit of the story. But I'd done that in the Arctic crawled into the den in the Arctic, and the wolves stayed there the whole summer. They didn't move the den, they didn't leave, but they were like family to me, they trusted me. These wolves don't trust me. I haven't seen them with my eyes. I've not seen the mother or the father. I don't know who these wolves are. I've seen them on the trail cam, but I've never seen them with my eye. I haven't heard them howl. So it's, it's haunting, it's nearly haunting to me. So it's like finding a treasure under your bed that was always there. It, I'm trying to think of another analogy. In your cupboard, you find a stack of gold or a Rembrandt painting. And I didn't know what to do with it, except just get out of there quickly, because I knew if I stayed, they'd move the pups. What I've learned in life, I'm almost 70 years old now, and I've learned that you really have to come in through the back door to change people's attitudes. You can't confront it head on and convince someone to stop drinking, stop smoking, stop speeding, stop killing wolves. You, you have to somehow come in the back door. When I met you, you're the, you're the only person I've worked with. Uh, why? I, don't, I just had an intuition that you and your message and your movie could make a difference. So find that back door. I don't know what that back door is. That's what I thought I'd been doing my whole life. I'm not sure. I get a lot of beautiful letters. I don't know. Easy to be discouraged. But I have to think that there's hope. There's hope. We'll see.
Then, the news came. On December 21st, 2014, a federal judge threw out the Obama administration decision to remove the gray wolf population in the Great Lakes region from the endangered species list, a decision that would ban further wolf hunting and trapping in the three states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota. U.S. District Judge Burl Howe ruled the removal was arbitrary and capricious and violated the Federal Endangered Species Act. She concludes, at times a court must lean forward from the bench to let an agency know, in no uncertain terms, that enough is enough. And this is one of those times. You see the Sunday birds swinging low And the fever in your brain only grows And the murder boys are running down the street You can see them through the window from your seat Hear the sound of the mighty With every breath you drink in the night You won't give up your blue without a fight And looking at the sky there is no pain See the stars are falling down like burning rain They were fired by the mighty Turning fast beneath the mightiest of 